morning. Oh, I just turned that off. Derek Watson here, the angry dentist. I uh, get into the swing of doing these videos. The trouble with any sort of blogging, vlogging, you know, vlogging, is you get fed up with it after a while. <laughs> uh, you. Uh, you sort of start off thinking, yeah, 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 this is great, this is good fun, I'll do this. And then the um, sheer sort of work involved in just doing something like this, you know, something else comes up or you go on holiday or something. So uh, I'm not going to make any promises. I know everybody does these things and then there's a break and they come back and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I've had a break. Oh, you know, I'll do my best. I've, my, I've got plans to do this. I've got plans to do one a week from now on. I, I've got to tell you, I've got no plans. <laughs> I've got no plans to do anything. This could be the first of a thousand, or it could be the last one. But um, the key is to make it easy. You know, you have to really. I, I you won't believe to do like. Um, well, when I used to write the leader for Dental Practice magazine, it used to take me half a day. I mean, literally, used to sit in front of the word process for half a day. You would get a uh, hundred quid, I think. You'd write a thousand words. It was like uh, ten pounds for a hundred words, ten p a word or something. But uh, and you think, oh, ten p a word? I can that, that sort of rate. I could make a lot of money ten p. I can write, you know. I'll just write and get ten p for every word. But you don't, that's not how it works, you know. You first draft of everything is absolute crap, rubbish. Sorry. Don't want to hope this to get an NSFW rating and. Uh, and then, of course, you just uh, refine it and refine it and refine it. Anyway, what I want to talk to do everyone today, and that's dentists and patients, is about oral health. Hardly a controversial topic for a dentist, but uh, but I think something which I mean, I qualified in '82, so I've got uh, 30 plus. I can't do the math. 35 years experience of slaving over a hot gob and looking in patients' mouths and talking to them about their you know what why, why the, whether they're healthy or not and if they're not healthy why they're not healthy etc so uh, what I wanted to do is pass on something at least the, the gist of the sort of the essence of what I've earned uh, learned over the over the 35 years and um, um, I had a, an associate working for me recently and uh, I work in a totally private practice and um, when she was working for me she was doing private work and then she said oh I've got a you know I'm gonna be moving somewhere else locally and I said where and she said oh, I've got a job at an NHS practice and I was like you know I mean anyone who's been in dentistry for any length of time that will make your jaw hit the floor you spend your life in NHS practice trying to get a job in a private practice you don't you don't work in a private practice trying to get into the National Health Service, but apparently this is a, this is a plan. So, uh, so anyway, uh, I mean, I couldn't offer a full time, and uh, she wanted a. F oh, she does want to work full time. So instead of doing what I thought would have been sensible, which is working four days or three days on the NHS and then um, keeping a private day. She decided that she would be um, better working in the NHS full time, so that's what she's gone to do. I think there's a, a, a crisis of. Uh, she's a little bit. Um, she's one of these people that you know. I'm a young dentist, and therefore I. Uh, I don't think I'm good enough to work in private practice, which is the opposite of what they should think. I mean, they, basically, when you're a young dentist, you're. You come out of dental school with the latest knowledge and very highly developed skills and um, you are at that point best suited to go into private practice. You're not, uh, if you go into an HS practice what happens is you're just taught a load of skills in inverted commas <laughs> which, which you then have to unlearn. You know like the skill of, uh, skill of how to treat three people at the same time or the skill of uh, uh, how to handle a patient if you're running an hour and a half late or uh, uh, you know the skill of um, how to do a course of treatment uh, including checkup, x-ray, scale and polish, any number of fillings, any number of root treatments, any number of 
extractions for £75 flat rate fee, that skill, you know. So, so I, obviously I didn't agree with her decision, but on the last um, day, and not only on the last day, but on the last minute of the last day, when, when she'd finished all her clinical patients and I was sitting in the office and uh, she'd got her coat on and we were about, I know, and I'd sort of given her a goodbye present and she was literally about to walk out the door. She stood in the uh, doorway of the office and said to me, you know, look, uh, Derek, um, I'm off now. Um, is there anything you'd like to tell me, you know? Is there anything... What, what would you say? What last piece of advice could you give me? What, um, you know, what do I need to know? <laughs> so I don't, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, you've waited. You've waited until the last 10 seconds of the last minute, of the last hour, of the last day that you're working here to actually ask me something. Um, because, again, that's the other thing with young practitioners, they are... You know, they don't, uh, I wouldn't say they don't listen, but they just, they've sort of been trained to uh, think that they don't need to listen. I don't know whether that uh, happens at dental school. I, um, I think there was a certain element of it when I was at dental school. You know, you were told that uh, when you go into general practice, you're gonna be like a, a minnow in a pool of sharks, and therefore you should, listen to your hallowed lecturers from university and not uh, you know and and not and don't absorb any of the knowledge that uh, you know you'll you'll be told to oh no that's no good you've got to do it this way so don't listen to that you know stick to your principles stick to what you're told and of course uh, what you're trained to do is see four patients a day and then and nobody is ever going to survive in general practice seeing four patients a day so in practice, I was seeing 40 patients a day. Um, so, you know, you're, and, and the people in general practice, for my, for my, in my opinion, for the most part, were very well-meaning people. There are, there are people, there were people, and there still are people who are in dentistry merely for the money, and where they will do whatever brings them the most income, irrespective of, you know, providing it's loosely aligned with the patient's needs let's put it that way um, but but that's not at all typical for the most part people who work in general practice they live and die by their reputation they rely on repeat business and therefore they do right by their patients and they, they are a tremendous repository of information about uh, how to survive in general practice what can be done in general practice what shouldn't be attempted in general practice you know and uh, and how to do things quickly. I, when I was uh, director of the Southeastern Faculty of the Royal College of Surgeons, I brought a speaker to the UK called Ed Silka. Ed Silka is an American dentist, general practitioner, uh, wrote a book called uh, Building Your Million Dollar Solo Dental Practice. It's still in print, you can buy it from him direct. It's less than a hundred pounds, and I, and I honestly think it's the best hundred pounds you'll ever spend. But um, he uh, was a time and motion expert uh, and an efficiency expert. It was that was his sort of hobby. A lot of dentists have got hobbies. Some of them own a chip shop. Uh, you know, some of them are uh, stars on the golf course. Uh, but uh, most dentists have have enough uh, time and effort, uh, energy and money to to sort of have a sort of a hobby business, if you like. Uh, and his, his hobby, his passion was time and motion. And he set about applying that to dental surgery and a single-handed practitioner, he managed to gross a million dollars. Which when, uh, you know, this is 20 years ago, so I mean that was a fantastic amount of money. I was sent this book and asked if I wanted to review it. And I said, yeah, of course I do, you know. I mean, what general practitioner wouldn't want to review a book that how to gross a million dollars single-handed? So I reviewed it and uh, absorbed a lot of the principles, which are basically that a, only a dentist, a dentist should only do what only a dentist could do, and a lot of about delegation, most of which wasn't really possible in the UK at the time because at that point, uh, you know, hygienists couldn't give injections and nurses couldn't take X-rays, etc., etc. 
uh, most of which they can do now, but uh, I brought him over to the UK to talk to uh, dentists, mainly NHS dentists of course, about um, his efficiency improvements and and this is a guy who, you know, a patient would turn up who needed like uh, two extractions, two root treatments and two crowns and he would do it for them on the spot. Now, and this is a culture we don't have in the UK. We, um, you know, we are like, uh, pe people don't go to dentists to have their dentistry done in the UK. They go to the dentist to sort of find out what might need doing and then then they'll make an appointment to come back to have one thing done, like one filling. <laughs> and they'll have to pluck up, they'll sort of decide to do that, you know, they have to sort of pluck up the enthusiasm to have one filling done and then and then, then perhaps they'll have another filling done. And this is, is hopefully an inefficient way of doing dentistry. He he literally built a porter cabin which had four chairs side by side and a technician on site to uh, do to do the work and to do it efficiently. And in the UK, we're all shoehorned into uh, uh, residential property in the high street. You know, typically a dental surgery is over the top of a shop, up a, up a flight of stairs like the, um, the Matterhorn, and um, totally wheelchair and accessible, and uh, totally, but totally unsuited for any sort of efficient dentistry. Anyway, I brought Silker over, and uh, he spoke in London, and. Um, went down like a lead balloon and you know it, it took me a, a while to understand why because I was sort of t I was very enthused I'd read his book I understood what his principles were because it didn't help that uh, he uh, brought about a thousand slides uh, including his holidays and um, and literally <laughs> literally five minutes before he was due to go on in front of a packed auditorium at the Royal College of Surgeons, he dropped his slide cassette all over the floor. And he, <laughs> he, he crammed them all back in as best he could. And, but, like hundreds of them were out of sequence and, and dozens of them were upside down and back to front. So he made for one of the most hilarious presentations and I felt very sorry for him because you know, he he was only like a general practitioner. He wasn't one of these. And they were very snobbish. I've got to say, the Royal College of Surgeons were, were very snobbish about him. They, they didn't like him because he was American. They didn't like him because he was coming to the UK to tell them how to run the business. They didn't like him. Uh, but but one of the reasons they didn't like him was because he made was making a lot of money. And in those days, um, and still, I think a successful dentist is seen as a as a, a bad dentist, you know, a rich dentist is a bad dentist. The, the sort of uh, dentist who turns up uh, and parks a Porsche in the car park is is resented by uh, by uh, by the by their patients. Um, it's a it's a weird phenomenon, and but it's a, it does exist. If you're a lawyer and you turn up in a Lamborghini. Uh, your clients will be pleased. They'll say, here is a successful lawyer. This is what I want, someone who's very doing very well by uh, you know, t convincing the court that black is white, that uh, apples are oranges and that I'm innocent. And so they'll, they'll pay a lot of money and not at all be resentful about the fact that this guy is wealthy. But healthcare is completely different. Healthcare, for some reason in healthcare, Everything's expected to be done by the practitioner for nothing. Um, you, you're supposed to be poor, even if you're successful, even if you're brilliant, even if you're you're, you're fantastic at what you do. Uh, you cannot. I mean, you you can earn you can earn the money if you are you know if if you are very successful. But you mustn't flaunt it. You know you have to park your Lamborghini up the road, and um, and. Uh, and, and get into your Peugeot partner and <laughs> drive to work in some old rust bucket. And the patients who are sitting in the chair looking out the window into the car park will say, oh, yeah, he's a lovely guy, old Watty, 
he, you know, he's a brilliant dentist and he's obviously doing it for the love of it. You know, I can tell he's dedicated to the profession. That's what I like about him. That's what I want. I want someone who's dedicated to dentistry, who doesn't want monetary reward. Uh, you know, who, who doesn't want to charge me for it. So, anyway, yeah, so the RCS were really snobby about uh, Silka and it was a shame because he actually, these guys were all working on the NHS and they had this massive requirement to work fast. And he was the one person 20 years ago who was capable of showing them how to do it. It didn't fit in with their sort of paradigm and the narrative at the time, which was that um, they were all trying terribly hard to be, uh, you know, to project the image that what they were doing on the health service was, was as good as anything that was done in the private sector. And uh, they, you know, uh, a lot of dentists had an identity crisis about NHS versus private. They couldn't really explain the difference or they didn't want to explain the difference. They just used to say, look, I do my best work. I remember Joe Rich, chairman of the GDS, the GD, GDSC, yeah, the BDA's negotiating committee, saying to me, Derek, he says, I, I always do my best work. I always do my best work. He says, it doesn't matter if the patient's paying me privately or on the National Health Service, they always get my best work. And I'm like, well, that is patently impossible. <laughs> you know, that, that cannot be true. You are fooling nobody except yourself. But that, that was the attitude at the time. You know, nowadays, obviously, dentists are much more capable of expressing the difference between NHS private, between, uh, you know, on the basis of more time available, better laboratory, um, uh, better laboratory work and better materials. But in those days, we couldn't even, you know, used to ask a dentist, what's the difference? How do you explain the difference to a patient? And, and they didn't know. So that was a shame. And Silka went back a bit disappointed. I was disappointed. I was I was, um, didn't do my reputation any good to bring him over, but it's a shame because he he really did um, he really did understand that uh, the key to that you could do you could do dentistry at a reasonable cost, but to a very high standard. And the idea was that in America they have long distances to drive, and therefore the attitude is different. You don't um, you don't you know if you need ten fillings, you, you want to get them done straight away. You don't want to uh, drive back to 10 times to the dentist. So he used to get them numb and he used to do the left hand side in the morning and then he used to send them off for a minestrone and then um, get them back and get them numb on the other side and do the other side in the afternoon. And of course when you're shifting treatment volumes like that, especially you know as they are on a sort of pay as you go basis in America, unlike us where we, we have a, like a flat rate all you can eat buffet approach to national health service treatment where where you know your, your dentist is paid a flat rate irrespective of how much work he does so so as a result he does as little as he can um, that uh, that would have you know you can get very wealthy very quickly by and also have some very happy patients anyway I had a patient leave the other day because I told him he, he, um, he shouldn't floss I, um, I told you I'd start talking about oral health, but I'm going to have to leave that till tomorrow because I'm nearly at work now. But uh, he, uh, we sent. I uh, his oral health was very poor. Lots and lots of plaque, lots of gum disease, lots of gum shrinkage. And so, um, uh, what we do under these circumstances is we go back to basics. And I say because a lot of these patients come to me, they're using mouthwash, they're using TP brushes, they're flossing, or well, they think they are. They're um, uh, they've got all sorts of uh, in space brushes, normal brushes, electric brushes, and their oral health is still terrible. <laughs> and so, you know, so the first thing I do is I say, look, let's let's go back to basics. You know, let's just get you some disclosing tablets, get you a, a nice medium soft manual brush, and see what you can do with that. And in the meantime, I can't stop you flossing and rinsing and TPing and everything, but I don't recommend that at the moment for you that's not appropriate at the moment for you and because this bloke had been told by probably by hygienists for the last 14 years to floss and then he then came to me and I said to him basically you've got you've got terrible gums stop flossing that blew his brain up and uh, so uh, he then said oh, no that's I don't understand you know <laughs> I don't know what you're telling me there I've been told 
for the last 14 years to floss my teeth and that my teeth were fine and now you're telling me my teeth aren't fine and don't floss you know what sort of dentist are you <laughs> so unfortunately we've lost him <laughs> but <clears throat> I'll tell you more about my philosophy towards oral health tomorrow because it, it really does work and uh, and uh, you never know, you know, I mean, look at me, I could die of a coronary any time, so I've got to pass this on, alright, so I'll talk to you tomorrow.